consume as consumers in the society. It's reflective of what Antigua and Barbuda public is consuming. Then, Madam Speaker, the inflation rate will be well in excess of 4 or 5 percent. Madam Speaker, I'm very glad that the member for St. John's Rural East have said that these items will be also exempted from VAT. Because, Madam Speaker, with the introduction of the ABST, there will be great uncertainty in the economy. Take, for example, utility bills, Madam Speaker. Since this UPP administration has come to power, utility bills in this country have tripled. And that is a fact. It is a fact. In certain instances, they have quadrupled. They have quadrupled, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, we all know the fuel have gone up. We all know the fuel have doubled. A price of barrel for oil. We watch CNN. We know what the world price of oil. And you would have expected maybe utility bills to have doubled. But they have tripled and they have quadrupled. And you promising your agenda for change, Mr. Prime Minister. Sir? That your government... Yes, Madam Speaker. I'm sticking to the, bill. to the bill, Madam Speaker. But I'm saying that they promised that they would lower... And then they would remove, sorry, the fuel variation charge. They've done nothing. That's not on the debate now, though. No, but Madam Speaker, we're dealing with the, the custom service tax, and we have to look at the impact it's going to have on the general economy, Madam Speaker. And fuel prices, Madam Speaker, and utility bills. Madam Speaker, under the Labour Party government, utility bills was a basic, essential commodity. The member for St. Philip's North, as Minister of APU for many years, ensured that utility were, utilities were affordable to everyone in the society. Madam Speaker, in fact, we treated utilities as an essential basic commodity for all and sundry. And under the ALP, Madam Speaker, the Minister of Finance knows that we had a price equalization mechanism when it came to fuel products. We are we ensured that the poor and vulnerable was protected. But the UPP government has now removed that price mechanism structure. And what has happened? The price of gas at the pumps, Madam Speaker, have gone up exponentially because the, by a factor three or four, Madam Speaker. Why? Because they've removed that price mechanism, um, that subsidy. We used to subsidize, Madam Speaker, we used the consumption tax, Madam Speaker, and we fixed, we gave consumers a fixed price, and we subsidized it for 28 years. And anything in excess of that fixed price, we absorbed as a government. The Ministry of Finance has removed that now, and that is the reality of the situation, Madam Speaker. That is the reality. That coupled, Madam Speaker, that out of fiction, and they have, they have had insult to injury, Madam Speaker, by then going and awarding, awarding very lucrative contracts. Honorable Member, that yes, is Madam not Speaker. up for debate now. No, Madam let Speaker. Us con let us confine the debate to what is before us. The Madam speech Speaker. will be here shortly. You can have your opportunity to wax poetic and, and wide then. Please confine this debate to the bill at hand. I will, Madam Speaker. And in closing, Madam Speaker, I'm going to wrap up. I just want the assurance from the member for St. John's Rollies that these goods on here will be also exempted from the ABST and that the government will ensure that something is done to put back in the mechanism that the ALP government had to protect consumers when it comes to gas prices and to do something about the APU electricity bills. People are bawling about it, Madam Speaker. You have utility bills. My computer clinic in Parham, we used to pay $270, $280 a month for electricity two and a half years ago. It is eight and $900 a month for the same center. Madam Speaker, good. Good for the poor people out there too. They're paying. Good for me. I can afford it. But what happened to the less fortunate out there? What happened to the less fortunate and the vulnerable that their utility bills have quadrupled? And you have, you have, you have committed, you have committed in this, in this agenda that you remove the fuel variation and not done it. And Madam Speaker, I'm calling upon the Honourable Minister to do so and to ensure, Madam Speaker, 
to ensure that we lower the cost of living in this country. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to get in a few comments because after the illustrious contribution by my colleague, the member for St. John City West, and the leader on this side, the member for St. John City South, I just have a few comments and questions, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, James Grayman, a bronze medalist, a high jumper athlete who have represented this country at the highest institution. In the Pan American Games, he just won a bronze medal. He won many medals for this country as a young, proud athlete. He's getting ready to go to Cuba today. Today, as we speak. I was late for Parliament this morning because Mr. Grayman called me. He's down at the athletic office with no help, no assistance, no aid from this caring UPP administration. He has not been provided a per diem, a stipend, or a contribution by the Ministry of Sports to go to Cuba to continue his education and training as a high jumper, a Pan American medalist, bronze medalist, who have won several medals representing this country. Mario Davis, one of our best basketball players, who hails from the area of Gray's Green community, a constituent of the Honorable Member for St. John's Rural West, the Honorable Prime Minister, has been selected to go to Germany as a basketball player, a national player of this country, and he can't even put together the money to buy his ticket and have his per diem to travel to Germany to go and have a tryout. Daniel Bakabeli, a sprinter, ranked one of the best in the entire world, in the top ten in his class and age, who have represented this country and won numerous medals for this country. No assistance from the government. Ayata Joseph from Palam, a triple jumper, who wants to go to Cuba now to increase his skills and be trained properly, to be prepared to go to other meets. No assistance from the government. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I commend the government, I commend the participants on producing this national youth policy document. But what is the sense of having a document with no implementation, no follow-up? Where are the mechanisms and the systems to help young people to grow, to grow intellectually? But it's all very good, Mr. Speaker, to have the resolutions and have a charter and define all the things that we want to accomplish. But we must, as a government and a country, put into place those mechanisms to help those young people. I remember when I was junior minister of finance and the education board turned down three young policemen in the Royal Police Force of Antigua and Barbuda and they came up to my office and they said, Mr. Michael, we applied to the Education Board, we applied to the Commission of Police at the time to go and study law. And they turned us down. They declined us. Here are our credentials. Here are our qualifications. Here are our acceptance letters from the universities in London. You think we as a responsible government could turn our back on those three individuals and deny them the opportunity to go away and to study and to attain their law degree. I took the matter to cabinet and I said to my cabinet colleagues, here are three young, intelligent aspirants who want to go and become lawyers and come back 
They're going to come back into the Royal Police Force. 